Hi everyone, this is Ms. Romani, and during this lesson we will finish up our exploration of the six nutrient categories by learning about the different minerals in our food that are important to our health and by learning about the importance of water. So let's start with the minerals. Minerals are inorganic substances. Unlike the other nutrients we've learned about so far, minerals do not contain a carbon base that is made out of carbon and hydrogen. Uh, sugars, fats, proteins, vitamins, they're all organic. So that means that they have this hydrocarbon base. Minerals do not contain that hydrocarbon base. Um, they are elements that we need to get from our food in tiny amounts. So they are considered to be essential nutrients as well as micronutrients. The body needs many minerals that must come from our foods. Some minerals are needed in larger amounts than others, but the amounts needed in the body are not an indication of their importance. They are all essential for proper health. So for example, the minerals that are needed in larger amounts, sometimes referred to as uh, the macro minerals or the major minerals, are sodium, chloride, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, potassium, and sulfur. Uh, but we also need other minerals uh, like, for example, iron, fluoride, or iodine in much smaller amounts, sometimes referred to as trace amounts. And you may have heard of the word electrolytes before, maybe in relation to sports drinks, perhaps. And so electrolytes are minerals, but they're minerals that are dissolved in our body fluids. They include sodium, potassium, magnesium, and chloride. And as you can see from this image, they have a charge. They are all ions and they're able to conduct electricity when in water, which is what electrolytes essentially do in our muscles and in our nerves. They also help balance our body fluids, uh, balance our blood acidity and our blood pressure. Electrolytes can be lost in large amounts in sweat during exercise or during rapid fluid loss if you, for example, have diarrhea or are vomiting. So when you get dehydrated, your body does not only have to replenish water, but it often also needs to replenish the electrolytes that it has lost as well. Now for this next section, we will focus on only five very specific minerals. Some are major minerals and some are minor ones needed in only trace amounts. Um, keep in mind though that even though I will give you a lot of information about the functions and some of the foods that are a good source of each mineral, this is only a glimpse once again. Each mineral has way more functions than those listed and can be found in a greater variety of foods than I can name. So having said that, just like with the vitamins lesson, some of the functions in, in foods that are underlined in this lesson are there to make it easy to study for your test. So you may want to just make sure that you highlight those or at least if you're writing down the note, just write down the ones that are underlined. So let's begin. And let's begin with calcium. Calcium is the most abundant mineral in our bodies. Most of you have probably heard of calcium because of its role in having healthy bones and healthy teeth. And that's fair, since 99% of our body's calcium supply is actually stored in our bones and in our teeth. But calcium is needed for other functions as well. For example, the body needs calcium for muscles to move and for nerves to carry messages between the brain and every body part. Now, calcium is found naturally in many different types of foods, but especially in dairy products like milk and cheese and yogurt and such. But it's also found in some green vegetables, especially kale and broccoli. Uh, fish with soft bones, like sardines, for example, are also a great source of calcium because you actually get the calcium from the bones, uh, which you chew and then eat. Calcium is also added to some fortified foods, like, say, most cereals will have some calcium added to it. Now, insufficient intake of calcium or calcium deficiency do not often produce obvious symptoms in the short term, and that is because the body maintains calcium levels in the blood by actually taking it from the bone. Over the long term, however, not getting enough calcium can have serious health consequences for our bones. Calcium deficiency can cause a low bone mass and can increase the risk of osteoporosis, which basically means brittle bones. And this means that bone fractures 
can happen a lot easier. You can think of our bones as a sort of a calcium bank. Uh, when you're young, as long as you eat healthy, you can keep adding more calcium to your calcium bank account, which is your bones, uh, and you keep adding to it, and you add more to it as when you're young than you actually remove. So our bones keep getting stronger and stronger with more calcium as we get older. But sometime in our 20s, we stop being able to deposit calcium into that bone account. We can still remove it, but our bone's ability to store calcium decreases as we age. And we kind of tend to reach that peak bone mass between the ages of 25 and 30. So at this point, uh, bone can break down and it starts to break down faster than it is built. And this is why it's important for older people, and especially for women after menopause, to consume enough calcium every day in their diet, because that way they can get what they need from the diet rather than breaking down their depleting calcium supply from their bones, because that calcium supply is not being replenished, because we stop basically adding calcium to our bones around that age of about 25 to 30. All right, so let's talk about magnesium. Magnesium is important for many processes in the body, including regulating muscle and nerve function, blood sugar levels and blood pressure, and making proteins, bones, and DNA. Magnesium is basically what is called a cofactor for more than 300 different enzymes in the body. Now, remember when we talked about coenzymes in the vitamins lesson? Well, cofactors are, work just like that. There are hundreds of chemical reactions in our body that would not happen without magnesium, basically completing those enzymes that make those chemical reactions happen. So how do we get some magnesium then? Well, green leafy vegetables are a good source of magnesium, like for example, spinach, uh, legumes as well, like beans and lentils, uh, nuts and seeds, uh, and as well as whole grains are all good sources of magnesium. And a magnesium deficiency is uncommon in healthy people because our kidneys kind of limit how much magnesium we can get rid of in our urine and make sure we keep enough in our bodies to meet our needs. And because of this, getting too little magnesium does not usually pr produce an obvious symptom in the short term. But a low magnesium intake for a long period of time can lead to magnesium deficiency. And symptoms of magnesium deficiency include loss of appetite, nausea, vomiting, fatigue, and weakness. Um, extreme magnesium deficiency can actually lead to seizures, personality changes, and an abnormal heart rhythm. So that can get pretty dangerous. Zinc has many functions in our body. Like magnesium, it is a cofactor in hundreds of different enzymes that uh, catalyze a variety of different chemical reactions. It helps our immune system fight off invading bacteria and viruses, as well as helps our body make proteins and DNA. Zinc also helps with wound healing and is important for proper senses of taste and smell. Some good sources of zinc include all kinds of meats and seafood, as well as beans, nuts, and seeds. And zinc deficiency is rare in North America probably because of the high meat consumption. However, when it happens, it causes slow growth in infants and children and delayed sexual development in adolescents. Zinc deficiency can also cause hair loss, um, skin and eye sores, loss of appetite, uh, problems with wound healing, and a decreased ability to taste any foods. So iron. Your body uses iron to make hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a protein that is found in red blood cells that carries oxygen from the lungs to all the different parts of your body. Iron is also used to make myoglobin, a similar protein that provides oxygen to muscles. Since our bodies use oxygen to produce energy, iron is very much linked to energy production in our body. Iron is mostly found in red meat and liver but can also be found in chicken and eggs. Non-meat alternatives for iron include dark green leafy vegetables like spinach, as well as beans and peas. Uh, nuts and some dried fruits, such as raisins, are also good sources of iron.
Now, when levels of iron stored in our body become low, iron deficiency anemia can set in. Red blood cells will become smaller and will contain less hemoglobin, and as a result, we'll be able to carry much less oxygen from the lungs throughout the body, which will result in anemia. And symptoms of anemia include weakness, tiredness, a lack of energy, uh, problems with concentration and memory. In addition, people with iron deficiency anemia are less able to fight off germs and infections. They're less able to work and exercise, and it actually can affect their ability to control body temperature. Infants and children with iron deficiency anemia might also develop learning difficulties. And iron deficiency is actually fairly common in Canada especially among children and uh, women of reproductive age or who are pregnant. And if that happens, an iron supplement or an increased intake of iron in the diet is usually the treatment. So let's talk about potassium. Potassium is an electrolyte and it helps your muscles work, including the muscles that control your heartbeat and your breathing. It is also extremely important for nerve transmission. So obviously potassium is pretty important. Uh, a high potassium diet can also help reduce blood pressure and water retention and maintain our fluid balance. And a lot of people associate bananas with potassium. And yes, bananas are a good source of potassium, but many other fruits and vegetables are also excellent sources of potassium, like sweet potatoes and squash. Soybeans, like for example edamame, as well as white beans, nuts, and salmon are also good sources of potassium. And a national survey found that most Canadians are not meeting the recommended potassium intake. A Western diet is likely to blame for this as it favors processed foods over the whole foods like fruits, vegetables, beans, and nuts that are high in potassium. So getting too little potassium can lead to muscle cramps, uh, muscle spasms, heart palpitations, uh, low potassium levels can also increase blood pressure and can lead to high blood pressure um, or hypertension, as it's called. Now, I want to focus on sodium next. And sodium gets a bad reputation, and for good reasons. But it isn't all bad. We actually do need sodium in our bodies. Sodium is an essential electrolyte that helps maintain water balance and um, like potassium, it also is important for proper muscle and nerve function and it helps maintain stable blood pressure levels. The thing is, unlike potassium, which we don't get enough of, our concern with sodium is finding ways to minimize how much of it we consume. And that is because most Canadians get way too much sodium in their diet. Recent statistics from Health Canada show that the problem is common across all age groups and genders, but is more common in males. Over 90% of boys and men between the ages of 14 and 30 consume way too much sodium. And this is not good. To start, eating too much sodium may raise blood pressure, which can lead to strokes, heart disease, and kidney disease. It is estimated that over 30% of high blood pressure cases in Canada are actually due to high sodium intake. And high dietary sodium has also been linked to an increased risk of osteoporosis, which is brittle bones, stomach cancer, and increased severity of asthma cases. So then, what is too much sodium? Well, a common target set by Health Canada is to consume about 1,500 milligrams of sodium per day and to not exceed 2,300 milligrams each day. Unfortunately, most Canadians are consuming over 3,400 milligrams every day, more than twice the recommended amount, and over 1,000 milligrams over the maximum limit. So why are we getting so much sodium from our diet? Now, I know that this image here is a bit of an over-exaggeration, but the main reason we consume so much sodium is not because of the sodium that is naturally found in most foods, but because of the extra sodium we add to our foods as table salt to flavor them, 
and the sodium that is added to processed foods to both flavor and to keep them from spoiling. For example, check the difference in sodium between fresh tomatoes and the same amount of canned tomatoes. Even cans that say no salt added uh, have more than three times the amount of sodium as fresh tomatoes, which is better than the regular canned tomatoes, which have more than 35 times the amount of sodium as fresh tomatoes. And that is because canned, packaged, and prepared foods like canned vegetables, like soups, like lunch meats, frozen dinners, and so on, often have sodium added during manufacturing, either as salt or other common forms of sodium like baking soda. So, of course, we add salt during cooking and maybe at the table to add a little bit of extra flavor. But really, overall, that's not the problem. Because more than 70% of the sodium that we eat actually comes from processed, prepackaged, and restaurant foods, especially fast foods. So let's take a look at how this adds up while keeping the daily recommendations in mind. So here's a typical daily meal for maybe a teenager or a kid. A breakfast of whole wheat toast, eggs, and orange juice. That's 280 milligrams of sodium. A morning snack of whole grain crackers and milk. 250 milligrams. Now lunch comes around and um, they go to the lunchroom, the cafeteria maybe, and buy a pizza slice, just a single slice of pizza, but it's pepperoni. So cucumber slices that maybe mom packed up and a gelatin cup, say. And that's now 850 milligrams. And most of that is coming from that single slice of pizza. After school, comes around and there's an after school snack of maybe crackers, carrots, and hummus. That's 450 milligrams of sodium. And then they have to have a quick dinner on the go, maybe because they have to go to soccer practice or some other after school activity. So they stop at a subway and get a meat sandwich with cheese and veggies and a small bag of potato chips because it's a combo and maybe a Gatorade to drink. And that one meal alone adds up another 1,500, actually 1,585 milligrams of sodium, more than the recommended daily amount. And with that meal, the day's total is now 3,415 milligrams, way over the daily maximum and about the average Canadian daily consumption. So what really tipped the sodium consumption over the top was both the slice of pizza at lunch and the fast food meal for dinner. If you eat out a lot or if you buy too many processed foods, it is much more difficult to limit sodium intake, both because these foods are packed with it and because you can't really control the sodium that has already been added to food that you did not prepare. For example, one fast food burger meal will provide you with half to more than 100% the maximum recommended amount of sodium for the day. One meal that doesn't account for the rest of the sodium that we can't avoid by eating other foods. So choosing less processed foods and making more meals at home are a great way to help control the sodium that you eat. Choosing lower sodium alternatives as often as possible can actually make a huge difference. And those alternatives are out there for a lot of foods because sodium overconsumption has become such a health problem that consumers have been demanding lower sodium product products uh, from manufacturers. For example, here we have two equivalent ham and cheese sandwiches. The one on the left packs more than the daily recommended amount of sodium in a single sandwich, but the one on the right, made with a lower sodium bread, lower sodium mustard, cheese, and deli meats, has almost half that amount. So as far as sodium is concerned, little changes can certainly add up. And the best advice would be to eat more unprocessed foods, uh, to eat more of them at home, where you can control how you make them and you can better control your sodium intake that way. So now let's briefly talk about water. Water is an inorganic molecule made of two hydrogens and an oxygen, H2O. And we know water is important. 
And we know that we can die if we don't get water in as little as three days, actually. But why is that? Well, to start, between 50 to 70% of our bodies are made of water. That amount is higher when we are babies and gets lower as we age, but it's still quite a bit. So because so much of our bodies is made of water, it is not surprising that water has many functions within our bodies. Our bodies use water in our cells and uh, our organs and in our tissues to help dissolve and carry nutrients and oxygen, to eliminate waste, to regulate its temperature, to maintain other body functions like helping us breathe by keeping our lungs moist, which helps oxygen dissolve into our bloodstream, or by helping us absorb nutrients and converting those nutrients into energy, or by cushioning our joints as well as our vital organs. And water makes up 83% of our blood, 75% of our brain, 23% of our muscles, and 22% of our bones. Now, because our bodies lose water every day through breathing, sweating, and digestion, it's important to rehydrate by drinking fluids and eating foods that contain water. The precise amount of water each person needs to drink every day will vary, and in the past, a common guideline has always been to drink 8 250 milliliter glasses of water every day. So, 2 liters of water every day. Apparently, this information dates back to 1945 and a recommendation that was made back then, which means that we've been drinking or at least aspiring to drink two liters of water daily based on a medical rule that's over 50 years old. It comes as little surprise then that this rule has been debunked as a myth. Turns out that you may actually need more than two liters of liquid daily, depending on your height, your weight, your lifestyle. Uh, your living conditions, your age, the temperature outside, how much activity you did that day, etc. But still, you probably want to have a number so you can have an amount of water to aim for. Now, Health Canada does not give an exact recommendation, but the guidelines provided by the Institute of Medicine actually advises men to drink 13 cups or 3 liters of water a day and women to drink 9 cups, or 2.2 liters. And unlike the recommendation from the mid-20th century, uh, you can actually hydrate with water, but you can replace water with soup, with milk, with juice, with tea, uh, and even with coffee. Although water is still uh, recommended by Health Canada as being the most healthy option for, of all of those for rehydration. So it doesn't have to be just H2O, but it should be H2O as much as possible. And so that's it for today's lesson. I hope that you have been inspired to drink at least nine glasses of water or other fluids each day and to aim for a diet that includes a variety of wholesome homemade meals that contain a lot of green vegetables, fruits, nuts, seeds, dairy, beans, and some healthy low sodium meats in order to get the proper amount of minerals to limit sodium consumption and to make sure you get enough fluid to replace the fluids that you lose each day. And I will talk to you later, guys.